Hello, so strong nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back. Got my boy Luke Simons, like diamonds. And we've got Wyatt, the mock turtleneck guy. We made a lot of fun of you, and you decided to bring the heat today, dude. Yeah, you were uh, you were questioning whether I had the mock turtleneck. I wasn't going to give away, you know, any surprises. But I'm I'm here to show it off in all of its glory this week. <laughs> it is it. I don't want to say hideous because it could actually, it looks nice with your hat, but uh, it ain't pretty, dude. Oh, well, it, uh, it it's my lucky charm for catching a lot of flounder, which is what we're going to talk about today. So revel in it. Revel Have you really it. caught a flounder wearing that turtleneck? Again, like I said last week, now they're going to confirm or deny. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, guys, welcome to this uh, week's Tackle Tuesday. It's all about flounder. Uh, we've done... A lot of flounder tips for our insider members. We have done two courses. One was a uh, flounder master that we did with what not nine different experts, Luke. Uh, Might have been, I think, ten when you, know, you and CA were in there as well as kind of like bonus, bonus experts. And we started in Texas and moved, you know, through the Gulf into Florida, past Florida, up all the way to New Jersey, where we ended with John Skinner himself. And that was our Flounder Mastery. It was certainly one of our top selling courses. Uh, it was awesome. And, but like, still, it's so great. Still is awesome. Still, still is awesome. awesome. It's still there. But like, people always like want more. Like, oh man, I, I, I just, I want more. Like, it's like you can't get enough Flounder tips. And I get it, especially because they're so doggone delicious uh, and fun to catch. Kids love them. They're crazy looking. And then uh, Skinner did Fluke Mastery, which is really tailored up toward the Northeast. Uh, all, all of his specific tips on fluke and then Wyatt has been working on his own mini course that we are going to be hooking up our insiders with and uh and you might get a chance if you're not an insider I think you might be a little bit crazy uh, a little cray cray but uh we might give you guys a chance to uh, purchase it otherwise just join the insider club you get it for free so we're going to talk a little bit about that some of the tips and tactics lures best places best tides best mock turtlenecks to wear uh, we're going to be hitting it up hitting up all of it so where do you want to start Wyatt and, and we also for those of you listening we're doing this live on Facebook so we'll start taking some questions from the peanut gallery as well yeah so I think probably the easiest place to start is what's working right now um, so I think probably the best thing to do if you want to go out and catch flounder right now, just to kind of give a little bit of a background on what's happening. Flounder in a big period of transition right now, it's fall. They are moving from the inshore areas where they've been holding, you know, it started in the spring when they moved in, they hung out, made summer homes all throughout the summer. We're eating on all the bait fish that showed up. And now that it's fall, they're about to transition again back offshore where they spawn for the winter. So all these flounder are in a really huge transition. There's really big numbers that are moving out of a lot of the areas that we can't get up into in the marsh. A lot of the big bay boats that can't get into those really shallow creeks where those flounder like to feed in the summer. Now they are moving out to the main channels. They're at those creek mouths. They're in the grass flats, moving out towards the passes and the inlets. Here in North Carolina, they're along the jetties. I've been having really good success at, at just any of those creek mouths that feed into intercoastal channels. They're all over the docks. Now is just a great time to be catching them. But probably my most successful weapon in targeting flounder, other than my mock turtleneck, has been the Slam Shady Bomber, just because it's exactly the profile of bait that these flounder are looking for. A big, big mullet imitation big glass mitt, any kind of big bait fish is really what they're after. If you look at a flounder's mouth, they've got these really big, you know, giant dagger like teeth. It's really consistent with a bait fish diet. You know, we look at drum, they've got crushers that are more designed for eating crabs and shrimp and things like that. They will go after some, some bait fish, but flounder really love big bait fish imitations. And especially in dirty water, like I've got up here uh, in North Carolina, that giant tail on that slam shady bomber really kicks and puts a lot of good vibration in the water. So just twitch, twitch, pause in this under some docks at some creek mouths. I can feel out an area in, you know, three or four casts, know if there's flounder there and then just kind of bump to the next creek mouth and really just feel all the areas out. 
that I need to with this. I know there's uh, a lot of other lures that we're going to talk about, but by far this one has been the most productive for me for flounder. Any insiders who are you know listening to this, you've seen in all of my on the water reports. For those of you who aren't in the insider community, I show exactly where I fish, what I'm using, the whole nine. All the insiders can vouch. That is what I've caught 99% of my flounder on for like two months straight. I think the only flounder I didn't catch on the bomber in the past two months was on that marshmallow uh, when I was testing it out. So bomber has been my go-to lately in terms of flounder tackle for this tackle Tuesday. What, how are you rigging it? Yeah. So what I've ha been having to use lately, we did talk about it last week on uh, the, the, the trout and redfish rigs. I've been putting it on that, that Berkeley fusion jig head, uh, just because all of my redfish eye jig heads for my strike have been out of stock. So I've just been playing around with different jig heads, things like that. And those have been working really well. Uh, I will put it on some of the trout eye jig heads that I still have. The only reason I don't like using those too much uh, is just because the ones that I have are only three sixteenths of an ounce. And when I'm fishing for flounder, I really like one fourth ounce jig heads just because it keeps it down in their strike zone. I don't have any one fourth ounce jig heads in the trout eye. So I, I just, that that's the only other jig head I've been using besides that Berkeley fusion, which I've been able to buy in one fourth ounce jig heads. Well, that's why I bought a 50 pack quite some time ago. I'm glad I did. Yeah. One fourth, man. That was a Cody self. Cody, he, man, Cody, you must have a notification turned on anytime we go live. He's like always the first one. Whoop, whoop. Oh, Cody. Um, that's cool. So are, are you making, cause I think a lot of people think, Oh, you know, flounder are on the bottom, which is true. But looking at some of Skinner's videos, they don't necessarily always feed in the bottom. I know even our, our boy C Richardson had that one video. I think it was with Chris Herrera in Jacksonville and the flounder were like literally hitting top water, like coming out of the water. Uh, so my question to you is you mentioned one fourth ounce, how, how deep are you fishing? And, and are you always making sure to pop it off the bottom? Yeah. So I, I'm usually going to fish my one fourth ounce jig heads and I'm going to be pairing those with those paddle tails. I'm going to be using, usually using those at those Creek mouths that have some depth around the three to five foot range. Um, just because that is where I know that my three sixteenth ounce jig heads aren't going to be staying on the bottom, especially where, with the current that I have here in the Carolinas, I need that one fourth ounce jig head when it gets past three or four feet, just because I know it's going to stay down in that strike zone, even with high current areas, like I'm fishing for flounder. Um, again, if I'm fishing shallower than that, if I'm up a little bit further in the marsh, which I'm not finding too many flounder deeper into the creek channels right now, they're kind of moving out of all that marsh area, moving towards the deeper intercoastal areas. Typically, I, I will fish, you know, in that shallower marsh area with lighter jig heads. But now I'm definitely using a lot more one fourth ounce jig heads. So that's, that's why I, I wanted to make that distinction. Cool. Uh, real quick, Matthew Park says, very cool video, guys. How often do these go live? When should I expect my Salt Strong Lure Pack? Two-part question, Matthew. Uh, we try to do these on Tuesdays around this time, one-ish. Uh, a lot of it depends on weather. If it's super nice, a lot of times we'll be out filming. Uh, that's where Tony is right now. If you guys are wondering where, where Tony is, uh, he's uh, he's trying to do some, I think, some shore-based. You know, Tony's normally in a kayak, and he's going to do some shore-based tips for our insider club. Uh, so stay tuned uh you insiders and and when do you get your pack i don't know uh we send out a lot of packs if you're talking about uh one of the free packs um or one of the paid packs the bombers i know uh we had like 200 orders come in just yesterday alone uh send us an email support at saltstrong.com we got a whole team of really awesome people waiting to help you out um because we're not doing it from our houses here Speaking of new things, we've got a new office, new boat. Someone to mention that, Luke? We haven't caught a flounder off of you. I've only been fishing off it once. The weather's been so crazy. Uh, we finally broke it in and went out fishing Saturday. Got the first few fish. And then you went out the next day. Couple, nice triple tail. Cobia, no flounder? Yeah, boat's off to it. Yeah, no flounder. And uh, it's interesting that, so no junk fish either. So it was the first day was like four snook. Um, I'll use the lures too. Just want to make sure that no catfish get on it anytime soon. And then day two, when I was just cruising the beaches, um, you know, just, just breaking in the motor, we have to run it for like eight hours on a plane and, and you have to kind of, you know, judge or uh, change the speed. And so finally got some calm weather. So I thought, let's just go ahead and just cruise the beaches and maybe, maybe come across a triple tail. 
And sure enough, I did. And I saw three, two really nice ones. Both of the nice ones ate. And uh, they actually ate the, the leprechaun, um, which I'll talk about for flounder too, because they, they do work for flounder. I've got some of my biggest flounder on that type bait. But, uh, but yeah, it was awesome. So the boat's off to an excellent start. Could not be happier. So I, uh, I'm going to have some more triple tail this evening. We've got some great, great meat out of those puppies. It was, uh, it was awesome. The tower is a game changer. What do you think, triple tail or flounder? If, uh, in terms of taste, triple tail flounder is close second though. Triple tail is my favorite, uh, but flounder and the, and the flounder here specifically, I've actually been targeting um, lately because everything else is closed. I mean, like inshore, like the snook redfish trout, um, that's all closed right now, um, and it has been for quite a while. So inshore, flounders, in my opinion, by far the best tasting. Um, Obviously, when triple tail come in, uh, and, I, and I think it will beat it, but for the, tr the, the fish that's easier to catch on a consistent basis, which would be flounder, it's, it's here. And although we don't have a ton in Tampa Bay, there are a good amount. And right now is actually one of the best times to catch them because they're, like, like White said, they're funneling out. So um, like last, the last time I was fishing some docks that are, were near a pass, I'm just bouncing jigs on the bottom or I was using the shrimp, the shrimp lure in this case, but, but the paddle tails seem to do better. But uh, when I was testing out that the Brazilian shrimp lure that we have coming, mm -hmm. uh, I caught two, two flounder and I was only fishing for like an hour and a half. One of them was, uh, was, a, was a nice keeper that I, that I brought home for dinner. And uh, so they're there and they'll be there for, uh, I would say probably another month or two, if not longer. So, uh, so now even in Tampa Bay, which isn't known for a great flounder fishery, um, the, the local passes should be holding a good amount of fish. And that's really, it's not just Tampa Bay. It's really up and down the, the Gulf Coast. And, Cause and, uh, on the Atlantic, I lived in Melbourne for a while and I fished Sebastian Inlet a lot. In November, December, particularly November, Sebastian Inlet has some absolute giants. I never did get the 10 pounder, but uh, a lot of 10 pounders get caught there and, and now's the time. So uh, if you're gonna get out there, focus on those passes and inlets. And, uh, and although they do hit top water every once in a while, um, it's something that you probably shouldn't plan for. And uh, so like bouncing a lure on the bottom is gonna, gonna be the best odds. Um, because obviously that's where, that's where they stay. They're designed to ambush, ambush food from the bottom. So get right there in their face is gonna increase the odds. Yeah, but a lot of you guys, I, I, cause I've heard it from people who have said, hey, I didn't know you guys kept many fish. I thought you were mostly catch and release. And, and we are, what, what you don't hear or see is Luke fishes, Pretty much every day that doesn't mean all day long but you know 30 minutes 40 minutes lives in the water hit a button boats in the water and he catches so many fish i was like dude why don't you post more pictures like i don't want to post pictures uh so he he does throw back 98 99 percent of all the fish he catches uh number two what a lot of you don't know about luke is he's got really 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 curly hair and now that he hasn't had a haircut in in the entire year he hasn't had a haircut this year as we're recording this in 2020 and the only way to prevent all these massive curls where it looks like he's got a perm is to not wash his hair and so because he doesn't wash his hair he stinks he can't go to public so he's got to catch his own fish every <laughs> single week i was wondering so, where that was going yeah was just to kind of tie it all in together <laughs> luke is one stinky son of a gun and uh, the public's there in saint pete uh, is kind of frowns upon him walking in uh they said oh here comes that old bum oh lukey or, uh, or, uh, you know, most of the fish here we can't keep right now, but I do release, uh, I, I think the, the one true statement Joe did say is the releasing 98% of the fish, but when I catch a flounder, I'm keeping 98% of the keepers. I, I have a really hard time releasing a keeper flounder because they taste so good. Uh, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping someone here watching this uh, is great on Photoshop and can uh, take a screenshot of, of Luke and uh, do the big perm, perm hair and, and send that to us. That would be awesome. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's, let's pivot back to flounder. So you talked about time for up there. Luke mentioned something that I believe is true. November and December, even in January. I mean, this is kind of a weird year in terms of uh, the heat. I mean, it's still right now at, at 80 degrees out there here in, in most of Florida. Uh, what's the best time in North Carolina, let's just say the Carolinas, Georgia, the Carolinas for, for catching the, the big flounder or consistent flounder, I guess is more important probably. Yeah. So we kind of, 
we're on the back end of like the heat of flounder fishing. It really starts picking up in, in August and it's usually on fire through October. And, you know, as November comes to a close, it's really starting to taper off, but you can still catch them into December, um, mid December, really. Uh, just because if you're thinking about how those flounder move out of those marshes and they're traveling through those intercoastal zones, a lot of them, you know, in the summer, they're pushing miles and miles back into a lot of these marshes, you know, going north and south from these inlets. They're not really pushing inland, but some of these areas are really far from these inlets. So they still have to take these journey, uh, this big journey to go out. Um, and there still will be some juveniles that stay inshore that aren't, you know, a breeding age. So you just kind of got to play around and know what the relative, you know, temperature has been. If it's been, you know, a really sharp cold snap and it's stayed cold, um, you know, those flounder are going to move out, you know, a lot faster. If it's been gradual, like we've had this year, that season's going to extend. We're still catching a lot of flounder here in North Carolina. For me, I really wasn't catching anything in December just because we had such a harsh snap last year. Uh, and this year, I'm still catching them in really, really good numbers. I'm, I was surprised on my last trip that I went out how many flounder I, I was catching. So now is still a pretty good time to be catching flounder. I'd say, like Luke said, almost down in Florida till probably mid-December, um, you, you're still going to be able to get some good flounder fishing here in the mid-Atlantic. And same in Texas, I saw someone asked about uh, Corpus Christi area, uh, Don. Um, same in Texas. There, I mean, we're, you know, we're seeing reports in our insider club of a lot of flounder. I mean, this week, there's been a lot of them. Uh, this past weekend, there was a ton of flounder reports. So it is still happening from Texas to North Carolina right now, which is, uh, which is cool. Um, have you ever caught a 10 pounder, Wyatt? If you're going that big? No, I haven't caught a 10 pounder. I came That's really cool. close to catching a citation size. Well, I think it was a citation. The season wasn't open. It's been closed here in North Carolina due to some, some some tough commercial fishing that we've been experiencing joe i know you might be talking to somebody about that soon but uh it's it's been tough to keep flounder and actually get records and stuff and i don't take a scale out with me so i really all i have to go off of is is the length and the historical you know what would a flounder weigh if it's this long and the biggest one i've caught was 23 inches um but man it was a fat 23 inch flounder it was it was almost as fat as it was long. I'm sure if I weighed that thing, it was probably uh, upwards of six, seven pounds. It was a giant fish. So what is the citation limit there? Or what's the threshold? I want to say it's six pounds. I want to say it's six pounds. But that fish definitely was citation citation weight. I think uh, I don't think they have a citation release length. They have that for some fish like trout here in North Carolina, but not for flounder. You have to weigh it in to get the citation. Yeah, what Wyatt was talking about is uh, the C CCA North Carolina is is suing, right? There's a lawsuit, and I'm going to have the the head of CCA uh, North Carolina the podcast next week. Uh, wh what's kind of the overall? Who who the heck are they suing? It's about gillnets. So who do you even sue? Is it just the whole commercial fishing industry, or? Yeah, so uh, basically the way that the fisheries are managed here in North Carolina, it's a little bit different than down in Florida, where you've got you know a state agency that's kind of non-biased and, and the citizens take part in it. You know, you guys were able to have a vote as citizens on whether gillnets should be in your waters or not. We don't have that up here. It's managed by a organization that's not necessarily the state itself. It's called the Division of Marine Fisheries, um, but it's not connected, you know, to like the wildlife resources. It's kind of weird because uh, most of the people that sit on the committee are commercial fishermen. and oh, the convenient. Oh yeah. And the, uh, the, the issue is that flounder have been getting hit by a lot of these gill nets, which is something that no other state has. We've seen a giant decline in flounder stocks, but, uh, this is the land of giants up here. So if we could get things straightened out, I mean, the fishery, there would be a lot more 10 pounders around than they are, um, right now, just because the, the, the stocks are just hit so hard by these nets, especially in the nursery areas where these fish, uh, you know, the, the juveniles grow up. Yeah. There'd be more trout. There'll be more redfish. Uh, North Carolina, I mean, you guys have the state or the, the world record for the red drum, right? That's correct. Or at least the pounds. national. Yeah. Yeah. Up in Hatteras. Yeah. And I know we've got some really big flounder that have been caught here too. I don't know if it's world record flounder, but definitely some big flatties up here too. Woo. All right. Uh, what about tides? That's an important one. It's one that always comes up. Have you found there is a, a better tide? I know I've watched some of your, your videos and you'll kind of sit there at these creek mouths. And uh, the tide's coming out. 
right? And some of these, and you're just casting up and popping off the bottom along with it. Is there a, a better tide for, uh, for flounder? Yeah. So you can catch them at both tides. And you, it's funny, you touched uh, earlier this week, we saw a lot of people that made reports over the weekend that they had really, really good flounder fishing. And the reason for that was, is I'm pretty sure we had the new moon last weekend. Is that correct? Sunday. Yep. Yep. So what happened was this, this big tidal movement occurs where there's, you know, that on new moons, it's going to move a lot more water. So on the bottom of that low tide, there's going to be less water in those small estuaries. They're going to dry up a little bit more. There's going to be more bait that comes out. And those flounder can feel where that tide ebb and flows from. So especially, like you said, Joe, those creek mouths, if you can get there when there's really good tide movement, if the moon phase is going to be displacing a little bit more water, those flounder can feel where that, you know, flow is going to be from. And they're going to concentrate a little bit closer to those creek mouths where all that bait that you know usually there might be a couple more inches where some more can kind of sit up in those shallow areas but with a new moon that area probably got completely dry people that you know might not have been catching flounder in an area uh you know say a creek mouth with that increased tidal flow more of them showed up to that area higher probability that those people were going to get onto those fish and that's exactly what happened especially on outgoing tides you can sit at those creek mouths those flounder will sit you know directly in the middle of the channel and at the points. That's why I said I only make two or three casts uh, to feel out a creek mouth just because it's, you know, I can hit a point, middle of the channel and the other point, and I know whether there's flounder there or not. They're, to me, the least picky fish if you hit them on the right tide because that's their opportunity to feed. They're waiting for that conveyor belt of food. Uh, that's the reason I like creek mouths, uh, just especially on those outgoing tides. That is a conveyor belt of food for them. You can catch them on incoming tides, but the only problem with that is they're going to, again, turn around and they're going to be looking at the mouth of that creek. So you have to find a way to work around the back of that. And it's a little bit more work, which is why I usually focus my efforts on outgoing tides. But when I was kind of going through some of the modules in the flounder mini course that I'm creating, I was looking in Florida and it seemed like there were a lot more areas where there were opportunities for incoming tide spots because down in Florida, there's not all of the winding creeks and stuff that you have to figure out a way to get back in and work behind. Those flounder that are down in Florida from talking to Luke and watching the insider reports from him and Tony and kind of studying where those flounder like to hold, it seems like they like the depth changes that are right off of those grass flats. So if there's an incoming tide from the inlet that's bringing in a lot of bait and that water is washing over one of those flats or that current is washing over one of those flats, it's gonna bring all that bait into that first gut or that depth change. And those flounder, even if it's just a couple inches, you know, they're very flat, they're gonna sit right at that depth change, right at the edge of that grass flat. Any kind of lip that you've got coming off of a flat, flounder will sit there and they will just pick off all the bait that's getting washed by that current. Same thing with smaller passes. It's the same kind of concept uh, that we were talking about with Creek Mouse and those work great on both incoming outgoing tides. Uh, just if there's a good steady movement of water, you don't wanna be fishing in an area where there's no current, but incoming versus outgoing, I would say it's just dependent on where you can get good positioning. That's probably the biggest thing. I'm not gonna say there's one tide that's better than another. It's just about picking spots that you can get into good positioning with. Cause I catch them all the time on incoming and outgoing. I just tend to have better success in my winding marshes uh, because I can really only get in position without running over fish on outgoing tides. And ha talk about that. I know that comes up quite a bit, especially for anglers who are fishing in a kayak is, you know, you're, you're facing the Creek mouth, right? Cause you're casting up into it. How are you positioning your kayak so that you're not getting swept away or moved all over the place and, yeah, so I, I thankfully Luke has loaned me a pedal kayak from Old Town and it has been fantastic because I can just put myself in those areas where there's current and just kind of position with the, the steering knob and I can work those pedals. But if you don't have a pedal kayak, you know, I did not have one for a very long time and I've still caught a lot of flounder. What I used was a brush anchor. So that's a really great tool. It's a, especially with those ticket anchors that you have to get all the way to the bottom. And, you know, with these Creek mouse that are really deep and there's this heavy current, it's kind of hard to get into position with a ticket anchor. And I don't like traditional anchors um, just because they make a lot of noise. A lot of times with the mud that we have here in North Carolina, they'll continue to slide until they hit an oyster rock. So, you know, I may deploy that grapple anchor and it, it's going to slide, you know, 10 yards and then I'm out of position. But the brush anchor is really, really good because if, you know, let's say I've got a creek mouth in front of me and that tide's coming out, I'll move, you know, to the south side 
of that creek mouth where the water is going to be flowing towards me and I'll take my brush anchor which is basically a giant you know clip with jaws on it that I'll grab onto that grass with if you're down in Florida you'd be able to grab onto mangrove branches things like that and you can have it tied to your kayak and it's much more secure uh, and you don't have to have you know shallow water uh, like the stick it pins do and you can just clip onto that grass and that current's going to be coming towards you. Again, you're not going to be able to work as many angles as you would in a pedal kayak, but you can still work that downward flow of current that those flounder are going to be sitting in clipped a little bit south of that creek mouth. So I used the, the, the brush anchor a lot when I didn't have the pedals, but now that I have the pedals, basically I'm just sitting in that flow of current. Uh, and I had a, a video recently where I had a drone view of exactly how I was working that creek mouth basically just hitting the angle of the point, hitting the middle of the channel, and then hitting the other point. And I would just move on to the next creek mouth. You really have to play that numbers game uh, because flounder will let you know if they're there. And usually if you find one, you know, there's two or three more that are sitting there. But if I'm not finding anything, next creek mouth. I have six or seven creek mouths that I plan out when I go flounder fishing, just because it's a numbers game with these fish. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not, but you can feel it out in three casts and really make the most of your time when you're out on the water if you do that planning beforehand. Sweet. Luke, um, Sebastian, you mentioned fishing that a, a quite a bit. I know one time we were there with Deeks, we passed that that guy who uh, who is known as like the founder king of Sebastian Inlet. Do you remember that? No, but go go ahead. Um, so anyhow, he was, he, apparently this guy wins like every tournament there. He's got all the, the records uh, in terms of size and like he, that's just all he does. He is the flounder guy. I believe he's got a commercial license for him and he just has these things dialed in and he was anchored there almost like dead in the middle of Sebastian and it was definitely incoming uh because I remember you know his boat was looking at us when we were we were waving to him as we went by uh was is that the time that you were fishing in the in the passes or, or is there a better time uh when you're talking yeah. about the passes in the inlets yeah, I didn't care about the direction and coming out going. I just wanted to be moving. So anything other than slack. Um, outgoing has a slight advantage because just everything's flushed out or is flushing out, but there's still a lot of bait being moved on the incoming and flounder seemed to really like the the heavy current areas. And so like that guy, um, I don't remember that exact situation, but a good strategy for Sebastian Inlet is that to actually fish the middle of the of the, the channel because there's a lot of rocks in there what they where they usually will position they do like structure but they're designed to lay on sand or something flat so if there's some rocks or jetties or seagrass they're they're rarely going to be on top of it they will most almost always be right on the bottom next to the side of it so if, if you're fishing rock piles or ledges that there's a lot of in sebastian inlet they're they're going to be right on the edge and so that that guy the, the people who really crush them they know the specific little ledges that hold the most flounder and they anchor themselves right on top of it. So they can sit there and just pick them off one at a time. If you don't know those, that where those spots are, uh, which most people don't, and, and the best way to find them is, is what I used to do is um, I would just drift through the, the pass and, and the same thing works in any pass or inlet. So it doesn't have to be Sebastian, but I would drift through, get a, a jig, a jig head, uh, paddle tails seem to work better. Like the slam shadies are, are awesome for it. Uh, gulp shrimp can work too. I used to always uh, used to use uh, gulp pogies as well. Um, but instead of using a normal jig head, get a weedless one. Um, I don't have one near me, but but Mission Fishing has some. We actually have some on our tackle on our tackle store. The Mission Fishing ones that have that uh, that that weed guard, and that way you can sit there and bounce on the bottom and just have it straight down, just vertical and bounce at the bottom, feel the bottom, every drop, feel that bottom. And when you hit, when you hit a rock, note it, right? If you, if you, if you go through an area, you're hitting a bunch of rocks, odds are there's going to be flounder nearby. And uh, the fact that you have the weed guard on there, you're going to get, you're not going to get snagged very often at all. Um, it's, it's actually kind of tough to get snagged when you're vertical fishing with a weedless jig head. Um, the bad thing about the weedless jig heads is you are going to miss some strikes, um, but it's worth it. You will definitely catch fish. You will definitely miss some strikes, but you're going to get snagged way less often than ever before. And most importantly, you're going to be able to start logging the different rock structures in the jetty. So um, that would be a, a good tip to do uh, if you're if you're new to a spot to uh, to just try to start learning it. Cool, that's solid. Um, talk about bucktails because I know you know with Skinner that's. Um 
that's probably his his go to. Uh, I know it's the go to for a lot of flounder anglers. Um, Wyatt, thoughts on good old fashioned bucktail? Oh, you're holding one right there, right? It almost blended in with your beautiful little turtleneck there. Mock turtleneck, yeah. So bucktails are extremely effective, especially with doormats. So you know we're talking about this big transition that flounder are going through right now. This, I know, especially here in North Carolina, when you're fishing those jetties, and I saw we did have a question from someone that was uh, in Corpus Christi, Texas. I know there's some really big jetties down in Texas too. This exact same strategy is going to work there. Those big breeding flounder that are moving out, their last pit stop before their big journey offshore, you know, we've talked about how they like structure. They're not going to hold directly on structure, but they're going to stay close to it. Those jetties are their last pit stop to get food before they make this big journey offshore. So they're sitting there, they're feeding, they're feeding, they're feeding, and then they're going to transition. Right now is the time that they're feeding. So if you can get on those jetties and you know where that structure is, bucktails with some kind of trailer on them. You can put the Slam Shady Bomber. You can put the Paddler Z. You can put, um, I know a lot of guys here like to use those gulp grubs. That's a, a, a really big one here just because they got that curly tail on them. Got a little bit of action as they drop. And again, vertical movements are really big for flounder. They're always looking up. They've got kind of a cone of vision. So the more vertical movements that you can make while still keeping it close enough to the bottom that on the pause, it's going to come back down in their strike zone. That's great. Bucktails are like the primo bait to be, or primo lure to be using. You can use it without a trailer as well. I know Skinner's course, that is like the number one thing that he used. Uh, he did kind of tip it sometimes with some flounder belly of some ones that he caught just to give it a little extra scent, but you can use just bare bucktails. You can troll them, you can bounce them and they're extremely effective up North where Skinner's fishing. You're basically just going to be trolling along any of those ledges and those flounder sit. We, you can watch those videos because we've got them on our site. Those flounder literally sit right on that ledge. And as soon as they see that bucktail come over that ledge, whether you're you know trolling it or bouncing it, they're going to start following it, following it, following it. And it seems like every time that that lure starts to make a vertical descent downward, that's when that flounder comes up and grabs it. So after watching those videos, I adjusted my retrieve to do that twitch, twitch, pause, twitch, twitch, pause. And I can really feel out an area. And once I've done that, I know that I've given that flounder every opportunity to hit that lure. And it seems like, you know, when I'm fishing a lot faster, I still will have flounder that will actually come up to my kayak. I've seen them come up before and try to take a swipe of that lure as I'm pulling it out, just because that's their last chance. They, they'll sit there and they'll follow it, but they're not going to chase it mid column um, most times. That happens very rarely, but I've seen it occur. So it's, you know, it's, this is a great bait for fish in deep water just because it's got a good aerodynamic head that's going to get down deep uh, and you can really feel the bottom with this thing. Um, I, I have not gotten a chance to use these on jetties. I have used them inshore and I have caught flounder with them as well. So if you know, you're working a deep channel or you're working a ledge out at a pass, um, you can use these from the surf. I know a lot of guys that catch them, uh, catch flounder off piers with them. They're such a versatile lure i mean it's it's fantastic you can add a lot to them you can really customize them any way you want i would say if i wasn't going to use if i if i didn't have access to paddle tails if this covid19 thing occurs can it keeps going you know and i don't have access to paddle tails i'll probably end up using a bucktail just because it's going to accomplish the same thing that i'm looking for out of that paddle tail those feathers are going to have some nice movement in the water as well uh, but luckily i've got a bunch of slam shady bombers so i don't have to worry about that Dude, we have so many slam shady paddle tails coming in it, it is going to be impossible for you to run out covid or not there we go that's that's our promise to you guys we got them in at fishstrong.com fishstrong.com yeah we and by the way I know I said it last week. You guys won't believe this. And you can email Daniel Nussbaum, the president and CEO of Z-Man, if you don't believe me. So last Tuesday, we talked about, we just got an email, like the order is on its way. And it was, and it got lost. But, and if you guys don't know the whole backstory, you know, the Z-Man Slam Shady uh, color in three different of their molds was the number one top selling uh, color for paddle tail and the minnow z in the entire world 
that's crazy. And so like, this is the hottest, you know, color. It is catching more fish. It's breaking records. We got now, I think 80 different species and then they ran out and COVID hit. We put this monster order back in March. So this has been going on for this long, this monster order in and like everything that could possibly go wrong. I mean, Z-Man having to shut down for quite some time. They've had multiple people get COVID. And every time that happens, they got to shut the entire plant down, clean the whole place out. You know, anyone who's around that person has to go out for quarantine for two weeks. Like it's just been not, I feel horrible for them because they, they just can't keep up with the demand. And then you had more people than ever fishing this summer because they couldn't do anything else. You had more new people coming in and a paddle tail is probably the easiest lure to go out there and just catch a ton of fish. And so like we sold out, Z-Man sold out. And we finally get this order. They finally get them. And last week it ships and FedEx loses it. No lie. They actually lost the shipment. They found it and it's on its way and it's supposed to get here any day now. It's somewhere in Atlanta. So if you're in Atlanta and you want to help us out and maybe go to FedEx and just drive it down, might get here quicker. Uh, it's just been absolutely crazy. But know that we have a big order coming in any day now uh, at fishstrong.com. Uh, so we will have, I think now five, no, yeah, five or six different uh, sizes and, and kind of different looking paddle tails in the slam shady. So we are going to have a lot and we have like uh, on the 2.0, we just got quite a few thousand more packs in and that sounds like a lot and it is, but man, we burn through those sometimes in, in a few weeks. Like it's, it's been nuts how, how well these are selling because they just flat out work the toughest part now is just getting jig heads to support them <laughs> you know it's been nuts so no, luke you have something you want to share your screen to see you yeah i was gonna i was just gonna say that um yeah those bucktails are, are solid and and this tip in particular i don't know if you can you see the screen yep um this one's this one is extremely helpful for the the retrieve this is this is um, one of skinner's uh, input so this is he has some amazing underwater video footage of flounder, you know, reacting to lures, tracking them down, striking them. And you'll see how aggressive these fish are. The, these are not fish that go up and nibble on the on the lure or the bait. They slam them. They're, they're not playing around. They're, they're a very aggressive fish. And so if you want to see it, just um, Google search, you know, flounder fishing tips. Uh, and you can put salt on the end of it and, and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see it on there. It's excellent. It has a really good video. So I highly recommend checking that out. But um, one reason why I don't use bucktails, so and uh, for those who've seen my uh, videos where I, I not rarely use bucktails, is because with flounder, they're not the pickiest of eaters. They're, they're super aggressive, and they're usually holding near hard structure, um, which means with bucktails, they're rarely weedless, and they're very easy to get snapped. And, and so it can be costly. That's, that's the reason. They catch a bunch of fish. But the the the, like the slam shadies or any paddle tail, any soft plastic on a jig head, the combined price is is going to be usually a much less than a, than a bucktail. Um, and then when you can actually make the, the the soft plastic one weedless, that's when it becomes, at least in my opinion, a game changer because you can get down there right in the right in the slop, you know, right in that hard structure, bounce through it, and you're going to get way more strikes. Even though you'll miss some strikes, you know, because of the weedless nature, you need to have a more stout rod, have a better hook set, but you're going to get snagged way less often. You're going to have much less frustration. And so, so what Skinner does is he usually is drifting the the big the big uh, inlets, and he's vertical fishing, just drifting through the the cut. It's a lot of sand, and and um, and you can see like little patches of grass and stuff, and those flounder just kind of kind of scattered throughout. Uh, at least like especially Sebastian Inlet if you're bucktailing for flounder you're going to go through a lot of bucktails and if you um, if you want to um, have the least amount of frustration then those those weedless jig heads with soft plastic is, is really really hard to beat and uh, and one thing one thing that's unique to flounder is just how aggressive they are is that I've had multiple times where I, I hook one I'm getting it up and they're pretty good like they do some pretty violent head shakes and the hook comes out and what they'll do is they usually just go straight down the bottom and sit and they are so aggressive that if you just sit there and then bounce a lure around that same area they'll hit it again i've got multiple flounder on the second chance right so i, I hook it i actually see it i see the size it goes right down like halfway out one in particular i was fishing the dock i pulled it 20 feet from the dock it got off 10 feet in front of me 
and it just went down. I was in five feet of water and I just sat there and I was just pitching the jig, bouncing on the bottom and the third cast, it hit it and I caught it. Um, so they're just one, it's a unique thing for flounder is that when they, when they feel a little bit stressed, they're just going to get on the bottom and sit. And if you put a lure in front of their face, they will eat it. Uh, even if you literally had that same lure hooked in their mouth, <laughs> they will eat it again. Yeah. Which is, that, which is cool. That video, if you guys don't believe Luke, it's in the flounder mastery course in the bonus module. It's like, it's, I've not gotten that to happen usually i'm fishing really deep so i see him shoot off i have no idea where they went i just you know i'll move to the next creek mouth but i uh i i saw that and i was just like man that that's so true though is they're super super aggressive and that's like i've said you know you can roll that lure in front of that creek mouth you know two three times you'll know if there's flounder there because they're going to hit it if you can get it in their strike zone Yep. So yeah, there, uh, Mar- oh, I'm sorry. What you got? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I also had a cool video. Let me see if I can even find it. Um, yeah, I can't find it on here. But the uh, they're when they're on the bottom, they feel secure. Like that's their secure zone. So even if they were just hooked, they're on the bottom, they feel secure. That's their safe space. And I actually caught one in a lot when lobster dive in in the Keys. I saw one and I had my lobster net, you know, those little small nets that you have a little small short handle. And I literally went down there and put the net over it and caught it. It was like a 14 incher. Um, just that you can just get really close to them. A lot of people gig for them, go out at night and, and gig for them because they will literally just sit there thinking that they're camouflaged and you can just walk right up to them or be in a boat with lights and, and you can get a lot of flounder that way as well. Uh, Mark asked, caught a couple flounder on paddle tails in uh, Rockport, Texas this weekend. It's a fun little area there. Uh, never catch them down by Marco Island, too far south. Um, no, Marco has some. They're, they're they have not, others. Yeah, not as many. Not as many. I've caught some. Uh, I fished on Marco a lot. It's, it's yeah. Growing up, we went there a lot and um, caught some, but not as many as Tampa, which has less than further north. So um, they're there. They're, it's really hard to target them there because it like snook that's the snook territory that's the, like the best snook fishing i've ever i've ever seen down there so now when I, when I go down that way it's it's targeting snook i see a question from jake brannigan he said he didn't have a lot of luck with flounder around the space coast he said he'd love to catch one just to check it off the new species bucket list yeah so just thinking about the space coast area there's you know uh, just at least in the mosquito lagoon um, zone. I know Tony's there. There's not, as we've talked about, flounders hunting habits are really based around tidal movements. Um, and, and there it's a lot of wind driven current. So your best bet would be to look towards those areas where there's higher current than the surrounding zones. You know, for example, you've got like the Hall over canal area, which there's increased current versus a lot of the other zones in that area, because it's just a choke point. Flounder, really congregate around choke points just because there's always going to be that conveyor belt of food. If you think about, you know, is this a good flounder spot? Does it have a conveyor belt of current that's going to consistently bring those flounder food? That's what you need to look for. And on the Space Coast, there's just not a whole lot of those, but there are still some. And Tony catches flounder in his reports uh, down in Mosquito Lagoon. If you guys aren't insiders, you could see those and see where those types of spots are. But uh, they're definitely down there. You just really got to look for those choke points where there's current. That's where they're going to feed. Yeah, and, and for the Space Coast, uh, depending on where you live there, it, it'll probably be worth the drive to go to, to, to the, um, the Canaveral Inlet, whatever that's. I I'm lose the name of it. Um, but the, the big, uh, you know, that, that inlet, it's north of Sebastian. What's, what's the name of that place, Joe, that we, that we um, launched with? Yeah, it's, the, it's Port Canaveral. Yeah, but there's a, there's a bait shop. So now there's, there's public access on the south side and you can fish along those rocks and now's the time to be there it's so, called Jet, jetty park uh, i don't remember the name of the yeah of the place yeah, jetty park that was the term i was thinking of so so that like now's the time so there are some in the indian and banana rivers and mesquite lagoon um they're scattered around it's not i don't think there's enough there to target um from my time being there and, and just the reports i've been seeing in the uh, in the community but when you get to those inlets, it's a it's a different ball game. Those inlets is that's where the majority of them will be. Sebastian is the best because it just has so much uh, water movement going through there. Um, but I would say the um, that Jetty Park should have a decent amount as well. But you'll be fishing the rocks, so you'll be fishing hard structure. So make sure to have something weedless. Otherwise, you'll go through an absolute ton of gear. 
but you can get it by land. You can get it. You can get a very good access to big flounder by land over there. Yep. Randy asked an interesting question. Have we finished testing the shrimp yet? The shrimp lure that you guys have seen now, gosh, it's probably been seven or eight months, right? No, not that. It's, it's been a long, it's been a while. It's been most of the summer. Um, and so, yes, the answer is yes. And uh, we actually have some coming and they're actually made and they're in route. So that's Check the Check this out, Randy. Hi! -o! I don't know if you guys can see that there. That's the packaging. So this is being done right now. We're testing out just the packaging. And uh, those of you guys who still made it this far with us, it's, it's called the Power Prawn in the Slam series. The Power Prawn. This thing is so stinking tough. It is catching monster fish. I mean, some of the biggest flounder, ironically, monster snook redfish trout everything um i i have a feeling there's going to be like doa is going to be like oh my gosh this thing is so much better than our our little doa shrimp you can uh, add triple tail to the list too joe uh so one of the triple tail i caught on uh, on saturday was on it i was and that was one of your pbs too huh yeah i was throwing the leprechaun uh i caught the first one the alabama leprechaun it slammed it and then the second one for whatever reason it just didn't seem to to want it and uh and we got closer and it went down and then it came back up and uh, when it went down i was i was getting my that shrimp lure which had a heavier weight on there to like just drop one and go straight down the uh the crab trap buoy and then it came up and so i, I had the rod in my hand i was like whatever i'm throwing it and throw it in there and it slammed it slammed it and so i don't know which one was uh, they're were, they're were both one was 23 inches one was 23 and a half i don't know which one got the bigger one but they were close either way there was my two best ones and uh yeah. it was cool so it just attracts big fish and it's so tough that's why it's called power prawn uh it's just it's tough to tear it it's got some of the best breaking strength we even put it in a microwave <laughs> do not try this at home uh it stunk up my house for quite some time but we put it in there with a handful of other popular lures and the, it won't it won't melt uh i put it in there for two and a half minutes and by the way like let's just say like a doa shrimp like after 30 seconds it's melted it's literally just gel and i put this thing in for two and a half minutes it's not even remotely hot i don't know what the heck they uh, they put in this stuff uh but it is it is awesome material and uh and it just flat out catches big fish yeah stay tuned we're hoping to ha have all that before christmas that makes a great stocking stuffer uh hopefully if you're i know like my wife she's like what if, like if it's not there by into november you've missed it out i was like no like most guys like do their christmas shopping the week before christmas if not two days before christmas um so we we plan on on having it right before christmas and we'll be getting them out same day uh getting them out fast first class shipping so stay tuned we are hoping that happens but, but certainly before that we'll have the z-man slam shadies in stock and we got an email from Daiwa. I'll give you all you guys the great updates if you make it this far our friends there at Daiwa, they have got a big order of Fuegos in 2,500 and 3,000 on the way. We have the 1,000s in. Uh, those are selling like crazy. The 1,000s are in, but we have the 2,500s and the 3,000s coming in. We got all the pin battle threes in right now. Uh, we have the Quantums in. Uh, some of the Shimanos are coming, and that's all at fishstrong.com. Uh, fishstrong.com and a ton of new lures on there as well. So what you, what you about to show, Luke? Yeah, Fuego 2500. They, this is the triple tail setup. And this was hammering it. There's a lot of people say that the frame flexes or has been the the uh, the only con that I've heard on these reels. Um, I at least haven't seen it. I caught the Cobia and, uh, and, and one of the triple tail on it on Saturday. And I, lo I, I love that reel. It's yeah. awesome. I'm excited to have more coming. All right, Wyatt, we've got a couple more minutes. Finish us, finish us up with um, a little bit more about this uh, flounder mini course that you're doing for the insiders you've been working on so hard on. What, uh, what else should we expect? Yeah, so basically in this course, I go over everything you really need to know. And I covered a ton of different zones, you know, from Texas to Florida up to the Carolinas. Any type of environment that you would be finding flounder in, 
I, I covered it. And I basically talked about positioning. I talked about what makes those spots good. I talked about some kind of advanced tactics. Once you get past that basic spot selection, went over all the best type of baits, not just paddle tails, because they will hit other things. Um, and, you know, this power prawn is going to be here at the best time of the year when it's winter time and that, you know, big bait fish migration uh, occurs as well. All those bait fish move out. There's not a whole lot that's available for those juveniles that are in shore, you know, those shrimp that are going to be there uh, as well. That's, you know, stuff that I cover in the course, what types of baits you're going to want to choose, when to deploy them, the best positioning. And I also shared probably three of the biggest mistakes that I see people make when they start fishing for flounder and the three biggest tips that I have to kind of jump that learning curve and get ahead of flounder fishing so that you can really maximize your results out on the water. That's stuff that I've never shared, stuff I've never put in all of the videos that you guys may have seen on the public side, even some stuff that I've shared with uh, the insider tips alone. This is These are three of probably my best tips I've ever given on flounder. So I'm really excited to share this with my insiders and uh, for anybody that wants to join the club and get access to that course as well. Yeah, and that's why those courses are, are so powerful. It's just tying everything in together. There's a lot of great stuff out there. Even the stuff that we put out on YouTube, obviously, we think it's it's great. Uh, it's the free stuff. We save all of our, our best stuff for our insider members. But the courses in general are just so powerful because it's comprehensive. It's just step by step. It's, it's instructional videos on everything you could possibly imagine. Because what I find myself doing on, let's just say, new species... Uh, if I go to YouTube and I watch, you know, I watch a 15 minute video, which is a pretty long video. And I still find myself like asking like 50 questions, right? Well, like, well, how did they rigor? Like, why, why did they pick that kind of spot? And they're always just answering just a small piece of it. Whereas these courses, you have every single thing you could possibly ask. So if you go through it, and even like those three courses we give to all of our ins new insider members, if you go through those three courses, like you will know more, you will be armed and dangerous and you'll know more than the 98% of, of all weekend warriors out there about finding the feeding zones, finding the best spots, you know, what lures or, or bait to use, and then ultimately how to use it uh, to, to attract strikes. It takes a little bit longer than watching a 10 minute video, but gosh, I mean, so does going to college. And so does trying to be an expert at anything, right? Uh, I mean, anytime you want to master something, you might want to put a couple hours of studying into it uh, to try to, to try to become better. And that's what these mastery courses are, are for. And uh, we just did a survey with our insider members. Thank you guys for filling it out. And it, I'm blown away how many people say like these courses have literally changed my fishing game. That was um, one of the top things. It yeah. was. So that was really, really cool. And so, yeah, Wyatt, we're pump, pumped about this. What are we calling it? Flop, flounder mastery mini course or flounder mini course or? Yeah, just the, just the flounder mini course. And I do want to mention one more thing. You guys, you know, you may watch videos on YouTube or, you know, instructional stuff and you watch it. You still have those questions like Joe said great thing about these mini courses is you have access to all the coaches on the salt strong team with these mini courses if you want to ask me a question after you've watched the videos i will literally be responding to people that watch this course me and tony do spot the sections for different types of species different types of areas so if you know you want your area dissected for what would be a good flounder spot you can literally ask that in the mini course and we'll do it as part of our weekly spot the section so really interactive and you can really figure out what you want to know plus a ton of other stuff that you didn't even know to ask with all these courses. So I'm really excited to get it out for you guys. Yep. Join us today. Saltstrong.com. You can join the insider club. You will automatically get this new mini course in your account. The second we have it done, including all the other, I, I feel like there's 18 or so other little mini courses, including one on triple tail, uh, Cobia. I mean, there's some really, really amazing uh, courses that you get for free as an insider when you join today. So uh, thank you guys so much. And then finally, thank you to Wyatt's mom for knitting uh, just a, such a special mock troll neck for, uh, for her little boy there. Uh, looking really, really nice. And uh, we do need to get you on a video catching a big fish in your turtleneck. Well, me and Luke can probably make that happen later this week. So we'll, we'll have it happen. I'll get, I'll, I'll get a, I'll get a big, I'll have to land a lunker in, in Luke's face in the, in the mock turtleneck. <laughs> They're coming down to Florida and they, yeah, we'll see if we can, let's we'll see if we can pick off a flounder and uh, bring, bring the, bring the turtleneck down. <laughs> cool. Well guys, we all appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, keep posting the questions. Uh, if, if you're uh, watching this after it goes live, or if you happen to be listening to the podcast, we'll have it all at saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. 
and you also can see a lot of the tips in the fishing tip section. Of course, our insider members get access to the whole kit and caboodle, including the private community and all the little mini courses. And, and now I think 400 and something instructional videos on everything you could possibly want to know to go out there and catch more inshore saltwater fish. And of course, 20% off all of this tackle we have coming in, including the upcoming power prawn, including the Z-Man slam shading. And we are going to let our insiders know about it first. So when it comes in, I apologize because we have to serve our insiders first and I know they're going to go quick. Our insider members are going to get a private email about the Z-Man slam shadies coming in before we take it, push it out live for, uh, for everyone else. We want to give you guys first shot. So we appreciate you. Love you. And uh, we'll talk to you guys on the next episode. We out. Peace. See you guys.